My name is Richard Bruce, and I thought I'd sort of explain some of the mysteries associated with dinosaurs and the Mesozoic. Um, this whole thing of dinosaurs, the Mesozoic, is rather mysterious for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, of course, why were dinosaurs so big? But then, what was this thing with the Mesozoic? First, you have a group of animals called therapocids, if I'm pronouncing that right, or the mammal-like reptiles, or maybe the proto-mammals, uh, and they take over the earth, you see. Uh, they become the big dominant uh, animals on the land. And then the pre-dinosaurs, or proto-dinosaurs, sometimes they're called the archaeosaurs, uh, come in, compete with them, and ultimately uh, pretty much sort of take over, at least the large predatory roles, and then they ultimately the dinosaurs. Uh, are taking over. Uh, and then the dinosaurs uh, hang on for uh, a long period of time. Um, but then, of course, uh, presumably the comet uh, hits something from outer space, and uh, the dinosaurs get wiped out, and the uh, uh, mammals, the descendants of the therapocids, uh, reemerge into the dominant role. Sort of odd, you know? This back, forth, back, forth. You don't expect that in evolution. You expect it sort of to go one direction, not swing back and forth the way that does. So anyway, let's explain that. Well, if we go back uh, to about uh, the Permian, in the first half of the Permian, and this is the period before the Mesozoic. The Mesozoic sort of has three these periods, the, Jura uh, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. But before the Triassic, in the Permian, first half, of course, is dominated by uh, the um, sort of like the finback reptiles and various relatives of the finback re reptiles, which um, aren't exactly lizards, but lived like lizards. They're big, cold-blooded uh, reptiles and a uh, uh, little bit different. Uh, actually, uh, we're descended from them, but um, nevertheless, sort of like lizards. Then about halfway through, the warm-blooded therapocids take over. Now, this warm-bloodedness may well have been very crude, but at least at first, but they take over uh, as the dominant animals. Okay, as we go through the per Permian, one of the things that sort of interesting happens is that the size of the largest therapocid predators starts going down. You know, they started big and they start moving down, and the, the largest of the predators are going down. At the same time, by the way, th therapocids are getting more and more species. They're um, getting down to the size of uh, insect eaters. You know, started off something like the size of a dog, ended up with uh, something the size, you know, some tiny little animal eating insects. Um, so they have a wide range uh, range of sizes, uh, and in particular, are moving from reasonably large down to tiny. Okay, at the beginning of the Triassic the archaeosaurs come in and they invade uh, the world at the top of the food chain, the top predator. Uh, now Backer, the guy who invented the whole idea of warm-blooded dinosaurs, uh, th thinks it's just amazing. So for some reason they were better at being warm-blooded, better with their new uh, 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 physiology uh, than the therapocids who had been perfecting uh, through evolution, uh, through natural selection, their um, biology for tens of millions of years, uh, even though they were complete newcomers to the warm-blooded game. Uh, because he said it must have been better because they took over the most hotly contested, fought-over position in the uh, uh, ecosystem top predator. But actually, they were moving into an empty niche. You see, these new predators, um, uh, archaeosaur predators, were larger than any of the therapocid predators had been before. So maybe they succeeded on the basis of their size. They were warm-blooded, uh, therefore they were somewhat competitive to the therapocids, but they really beat them because they were simply a lot larger than therapocids. And how did they get larger? Well could be that this is the answer. Very often, the largest predator, the big top predator, is uh, a um, 
comes from a, a group that is almost completely died out. It's a living fossil. Or in other cases, they come from something uh, from outside. For example, in the oceans, the biggest of the predators are, are mammals, the whales. So they came from the land. And other big predators uh, include the seals. Uh, particularly larger seals are really very, very large uh, by ocean standards. Once again, coming from the land, and that's not just true now. It was also true during the Mesozoic. Over and over again, these land animals, you know, go into the sea, and they become the big predators up at the top of, uh, of everything. So why is this? Well, we can imagine in the case of the sea, uh, if you're going to be at the top of a food chain of bony fish, it's best not to be a bony fish because diseases are going to travel up that food chain more or less like mercury travels up a food chain and becomes concentrated at the top. We know that it can be dangerous eating swordfish uh, and other very large ocean-going fish. So this is a trend that you see often. In fact, we can see it uh, if we uh, look at freshwater fish too. Uh, in South America, the largest of the um, South American freshwater fish is the apima, which is a living fossil. You know, hmm. In North America, the largest of the freshwater fish is the alligator gar, another living fossil. We also might mention, by the way, the sturgeon and, the spo uh, and its close relative, the spoonfish or something like spoonbillfish, uh, whatever. Um, more large living fossils. Um, and in Europe, uh, we have the wells, a giant catfish living on a continent. And this is it's huge, I guess, the largest predatory catfish in the world. Um, in fact, it is. Largest predatory catfish in the world. Um, and this, this monster of a catfish living on a continent, oh, there are no catfish living in, uh, in Europe except for one species in a very small part of Europe. For the most part, the wells, this giant European catfish lives in an environment where it is the only catfish, and therefore it's not going to be eating any smaller catfish, and therefore it's not going to get any catfish diseases from the smaller catfishes that it eats, because they ain't there. Well, except maybe for that small part of Europe where they, uh, they might overlap. But anyway, see the general, uh, general point of these things. Um, it's very important, particularly for the top predators, to be isolated from uh, the, their uh, smaller members, uh, animals, that are closely related to them and therefore are likely to have the same d diseases. And so this could be the key of the success of the archaeosaurs, the, the original archaeosaurs. Well, from there, we s simply continue that. As the archaeosaurs evolved uh, over time, uh, they begin to not only take that position of being the really big predator, but the f lower level uh, positions, uh, somewhat smaller predator, and sort of basically in order, you know, they just went smaller and smaller, um, but not necessarily getting really small. And then moving on over into the herbivore side, but once again, being the large herbivores for the most part. Um, eventually, of course, the dinosaurs uh, evolve. Uh, and the ma mammals are also evolving. The mammals are evolving as these tiny little animals. Uh, supposedly, you see, the mammals were shoved off into that position because the dinosaurs were dominating the position of being big. But this doesn't really make a lot of sense because evolution doesn't have shoving. What really is happening is this. The mammals are successfully taking over those small niches, which is very, very difficult because for a warm-blooded animal, being very small is a real trick because of the small size. It doesn't have much body to generate heat, but it is uh, able to lose heat all over uh, its body surface. So since the uh, ratio of surface area to uh, body weight is uh, so high, it's hard for them to stay warm, and it's difficult being small if you're warm-blooded easy, uh, relatively easy to be warm-blooded if you're large. So at any rate, the mammals are successfully becoming shrews and, and squirrels and all sorts of little things. Uh, but that means, of course, that because there are these huge numbers, hordes of small little uh, mammals, shrews and squirrels, etc., those things have diseases. 
and they would spread the diseases to large mammals. Therefore, the large mammals are at a disadvantage in competing with the big dinosaurs. And in fact, they lose out and disappear. Uh, and so you don't have large mammals. So why are the dinosaurs so large? Well, the advantage the dinosaur has over an elephant is the elephant has to worry about the diseases from the mice, which they are supposedly afraid of. Uh, I guess Mythbusters did a study where they said, found out that elephants do appear to be a little bit afraid of mice. Uh, but mice can carry perhaps diseases that will kill an elephant. At any rate, the elephant is filled with, uh, in an environment with all sorts of small things that could carry a disease that kill, the, kill it. The dinosaurs were somewhat isolated from that, except possibly uh, from, their, from the birds, um, at least as far as small things, because m mostly the dinosaurs tended to be large. And of course, they say, well, a lot of the dinosaurs are smaller. But when they're small, that doesn't mean they're small the size of a shrew or a mouse, uh, the sizes that the mammals uh, were at that time. So dinosaurs therefore can go large because they don't have these tiny little mice-sized relatives generating diseases. And then the same story can be told about the whales out in the ocean. Uh, the whales are very, very large in the ocean in part because they don't have to deal with mice-sized, shrew-sized, rat-sized, squirrel-sized mammals out in the ocean that could give them diseases. Um, the smallest ant mammal in the ocean being a small dolphin of about maybe 100 pounds and a small seal of about 100 pounds or 50 kilograms uh, for the more scientifically or European-oriented rest of the world other than America. Okay, so you see the point. Um, uh, with this thing of looking at the area of disease, and the key point is disease, closely related animals tend to share the same diseases, a well-known scientific fact. Using that well-known scientific fact, using the fact that that's really key to the spread of diseases, we can explain a large portion of all these mysteries of the Mesozoic, uh, why things worked out the way they did. And we get a, though we get a quite a bit different picture uh, the dinosaurs weren't necessarily superior any more than the sharks are superior to the bony fish. Sharks uh, exist out there essentially because if you're going to be at the top of a food chain of bony fish, it's best not to be a bony fish. Uh, and dinosaurs were a lot like the sharks, not necessarily superior at all, maybe even a little bit inferior. At least we know that they weren't able to take over the niches that were held by the mammals. Uh, and yet able to survive because they were relatively immune to mammalian diseases. Okay, I think that explains a lot. This is Richard Bruce. Goodbye.